Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Today in Genesis 4, we're going to cover a lot of things. We're going to talk today about Cain and Abel. It's a very famous story in the Bible, and it's uh, a lot of people, I guess, jokingly compare it to like, yeah, that, that brothers, that's how they are, right? Cain and Abel. I hope not. Um, one of them ends up dead, if you didn't know that. So uh, Genesis chapter 4, here we go. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. That's a really nice way to say that, isn't it? And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. And then notice in verse three, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, that is a word that a lot of people key in on, the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard, none. Now, let's talk about this for a little bit, because I think that this gets convoluted sometimes, and I think we make a mess of this. Some people will say, well, God didn't like Cain's offering because uh, Cain didn't bring his best. Cain didn't bring the best offering. He didn't bring the, the first portions of his offering. He didn't bring the fat of his field like Abel did. There's nothing in the text that says that. The text says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought to the, of the firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And so it, it doesn't say, but Abel brought the first of his flock and the, the, the fat portions. And so one of the things that's interesting is we can't really condemn Cain for the type of offering he brought. Offerings have not been prescribed yet. There isn't a, there isn't a way uh, that God has told the people to bring him offerings. So there isn't at this point, at least in the scripture, there is not a recorded way to do it. And therefore there's not a wrong way to do it. So a couple of things to think about. There are 1656 years from the time of the creation to the flood. Now, in a moment, uh, Cain's going to kill Abel. Cain's going to be banished. I know, spoilers, we're getting ahead of ourselves. When Adam is 130, he's going to have Seth. So that takes off a little bit of time out of that 1656 years from the creation of Adam. So we take off 130 years from the time that, that of the flood to Abraham. So, so from Adam to, to the flood is 1656 years minus the 130 for when Seth is born. I know you probably don't care about all this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. 292 years from the flood to Abraham being born. 100 years, Abraham is 100 years old when he has his son Isaac. Isaac is 60 years old when he has his son Jacob. Jacob is 130 years old when he moves to Egypt. And they are in Egypt as slaves for 430 years. Which means there are still around 2,500 years before there is a law for sacrifices. If you're adding up all the numbers, it's 2,538, as we can see in the notes uh, of the show. Now, 2,500 years until there is a law for what sacrifices should look like. So why did God not like Cain's offering? Everybody that I ever heard growing up would say, oh, well, he didn't like Cain's offering because it wasn't the best. The text does not say that. I will offer you this, a couple of thoughts. One, one of my favorite texts about giving, it's, it's the longest text in the New Testament about giving for the, the church, it says in 2 Corinthians 8, 12, if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. Meaning for the believer, it's not the size of the gift. The Corinthian church had promised a large gift, but now we're backing off of that. They didn't have the money that they thought they did. And so Paul's reminding them, it's not the size of the gift, it's the heart of the gift, right? It's, it's the heart that it's given with. And we find that to be true in passages like Isaiah 1, where God tells the Israelite people, I hate your assemblies, I hate your offerings, I hate your festivals. And he says that it's because of their heart that he, he dislikes the offering. In fact, in Amos chapter 5, he says the same thing. I hate your offerings. I wish that you would quit singing me these songs. I hate your feast because your heart isn't with me because you're not serving me well. And then again, even in Malachi chapter 1, he goes, man, I wish you would shut the doors of the temple. I wish that you would quit offering fire or offerings on the fire to me. He goes, because you're not following me. You're disobedient. So the only place in the scripture where, where we see God really rebuking people or disregarding their offerings is when their heart was wrong. And so does Genesis 4 say that Cain's heart was wrong? No. But the whole rest of the Bible shows us that the offerings that God rejects, the offering that he has no regard for, he has no regard for it because the heart is wicked. And, and let, me, let me offer you this. So uh, 
I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but 1 John 3, 12 says this. Let me find it here really quickly. And I wish that I had my reading glasses. It says this, uh, we should not be like Cain, who was, uh, the, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. And so Cain is an evil dude and his heart was against God. And therefore, of course, his offering would not be something that God would regard. Now, let me pick up again here in verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Now we saw in 1 John 3 that he did not do well. He was of the evil one. So again here, verse 7, if you, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Listen and see if this sounds familiar. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. It's the same thing we heard yesterday in Genesis chapter 3 where God was putting, pronouncing a judgment on Eve and he said your desire will be for your husband but he will rule over you and here it says sin's desire is for you Cain but you must rule over it and how those two things relate exactly I don't know I'm not smart enough so you're gonna have to do some googling for that all right I don't know everything and I won't pretend this year to know everything I have thoughts on it but nothing that I am content with recording and letting it just live in posterity for the next decade all right so I have thoughts on it it's the same language as the previous chapter. Super interesting. I don't know all that it means. Here in verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and Abel, his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? If you ever hear somebody quoting that, am I my brother's keeper? They ripped it off from the Bible. They're plagiarizers. Not really. I'm joking. I mean, it does come from the Bible, but verse 10. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Now this, man, uh, the voice of, of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Pause here for just a moment and let's just think about this for a minute. So I already pointed out to you that Cain from 1 John 3, 12 was called the evil one or he, he, uh, he was of the evil one and he, his deeds were evil. Did you know that in Jude, Jude chapter one, there's only one chapter in Jude. So Jude verse 11, it, it compares false teachers, false preachers to Cain, Balaam, and Korah. And so, so Cain is of the evil one. He is similar to a false teacher and he is, he is joined with some of the most wicked people in the Bible in terms of kind of partnership. But Abel, on the other hand, Abel is really interesting. He's only given a couple of verses here in the whole Bible. He dies very quickly. He comes on the scene and is dead by the end of the first act, right? He's, he's just gone. But he's mentioned beautifully in Hebrews 11 and 12 about things, can you believe this, that uh, speak to the gospel, speak further down the line than just Abel's story. There is something going on with Abel that speaks on a deeper level than just what's happening here in Genesis 4. So we find in Hebrews 11, 4, it says this, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than his brother Cain, by faith. Now, Hebrews 11, a lot of people call it the hall of fame of faith. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, I guess. It's, it's not what the Bible calls it. It's fine, though. It's a way for us to kind of shorthand and get to that text. But one of the things that we need to realize is that what the author of Hebrews is doing, we're not sure who wrote Hebrews, what the author of Hebrews is doing is trying to appeal to the reader to put their faith in Christ. He, in chapter 10, is asking the reader to put their faith in God, to believe that Christ is the means for salvation. And in chapter 11, he gives all these other examples of people who put their faith in God, who trusted what God had promised. And he uses Abel as one of those examples. And he says, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice to God. Now, he's also mentioned in Hebrews 12, 24, and in Hebrews 12, it is making a comparison from uh, Mount, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, and Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem. And it says those people who came to God or tried to come to God through the law were warned, don't come to the mountain or you'll die. And then we, we who come to Mount Zion, he goes on to say in Hebrews 12, 24, we have blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So two thoughts here, and, and I don't know where I land on this. So we have the blood, the blood of Christ, that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Two thoughts. One, some people argue that it is the blood of Abel, his physical blood that cried out from the ground, that made a testimony to God of, look what my brother has done to me. Other people argue that the blood of Abel is the animal sacrifice that he made. Regardless, whether it's Abel's blood that cries out from the ground or whether it's the lamb sacrifice that Abel made to the father, either way, and maybe both, 
Christ's blood is better. Christ's blood, the lamb that was slain, the pure and spotless lamb, Jesus, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, his shed blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel was declared righteous by his sacrifice to God, and you and I are declared righteous through the blood of Jesus, which is more powerful and speaks more beautifully than the blood of Abel, whether it was the sacrifice that Abel made or the blood that uh, his blood that was spilled. Pick up with me here in in verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, today you have driven me away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord will put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who finds him should attack him. Cain went from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. Now, where did his wife come from? That's a question that I get asked all the stinking time. Because in reading Genesis 1 through 4, we assume, assume that Cain and Abel are the first children of Adam and Eve. The Bible never says that. It never says that they were the first children. We know from Acts 17, 26, and we'll come back to this text a couple of different times, but we know from 17, 26 of Acts that God made all nations of men to come through one man, Adam. So Adam is the forefather of all nations of men. So short answer, Cain married his sister. Uh, Cain and Abel, probably not the only children of Adam and Eve, and, and probably not the first children of Adam and Eve, or if they are, there are probably children between them and Seth. So Cain married his wife or his sister. Uh, verse 18, to Enoch was born. So it's going to give us the descendants of, of Cain. I'm going to jump down really quickly to verse 19. Lamech, or Lamech, took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabel, and Jabel was the father of those who dwell in the tents and have livestock. His brother was Jubal, and those are the ones who play the harp and the lyre. And then Zillah uh, also bore Tubal Cain, and he was the forger of all the in instruments of bronze. Wow, bronze and iron. Look at verse 23. It says here Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me and a young man for striking me. If Cain is revenged 70 fold, then I am avenged 77 fold. Sorry, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, I read that too big. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech is avenged 70 fold. So remember, God says to Cain, I will avenge you seven times. And Lamech says, I killed a guy because he wounded me, he offended me, and I should be avenged 70 times, seven times. Now, very interesting. Uh, very interesting indeed. It is mentioned in one other place in the scripture. These exact numbers in this order are mentioned in one other place. And here in Genesis 4, what they're talking about is vengeance. So God says, Cain, I'll put a mark on you so that if anyone finds you, uh, if they kill you, you will be avenged sevenfold. And then what does Lamech says? I killed a guy for wounding me. I should be avenged 70 times sevenfold. Notice that one of those, one of those comes from God and one of them comes from a place of injustice. Lamech is just a wicked dude. So we jump all the way over to Matthew 18, and in Matthew 18, 20, uh, well, it starts earlier than that, but the verses we're concerned with are 21 and 22. And, and Peter is talking to Jesus, and Peter says, Lord, he says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? How many times should I forgive the person who wrongs me? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, I tell you, but 70 times, seven times. And so what's super interesting to me is here in Genesis 4, it, there is vengeance, and in Matthew 18, there is forgiveness. It's the opposite of that. And so that's another thing that we'll see throughout the Bible is that all these things that are undone by sin, Christ comes and, and rebuilds and makes new. And so here we have this, this idea that vengeance would be on the head of anyone who would touch Cain sevenfold. And God's the one who declared that. And then he said, Lamech unjustly says, I should be avenged 70 times sevenfold. And then in talking about forgiveness, I... Peter was such a, a crazy character in the Bible. He, he says a lot of stupid things. He says a lot of things that probably a lot of us would have been thinking. And he's going, he must have felt proud of himself. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But I feel like Peter probably felt proud of himself when he was like, should I forgive somebody who offends me up to seven times? And he's like, no, no, no. It's not, it's not, the standard's not Cain. The standard is unjust Lamech. You forgive them 70 times, seven times. You forgive the wicked 70 times, seven. And so I just find it to be an interesting kind of note uh, that these numbers occur in exactly this order in one other place, dealing with the opposite thing instead of vengeance, forgiveness. And so let's finish this chapter here in 25 and 26. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. 
For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth, was bo- uh, a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And at that time, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord, which is also a little bit telling uh, that this is the first time people are really beginning to call upon the name of the Lord. But that gets us through chapter four, and there are a hundred more things to think about. But I will see you tomorrow for chapters six through nine as we look at the flood. Have a good day. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.